who took that oath of office seriously and obeyed the Constitution. For instance, the issue of war. Uh, this is an important issue. All wars drain the economy, whether they're necessary or unnecessary. When the war is declared and it's necessary, you have to sacrifice at home, uh, which I certainly remember during World War II. Conditions were still bad. The Depression had not ended. When they're undeclared, same harm. The spending overseas is very harmful, but the real problem is is some of these wars that we've gotten into have been indefinite. They, we slip into these wars. We don't go to war like the founders told us we must do it with a declaration of war. Presidents should not go to war without a proper declaration by the United States Congress. If... If that would be the case, I think we'd go to war much less frequently, and also they would end more quickly. And that's what happened in World War II. We had been attacked. Wars were declared against us. We had a declaration of war. And think, taking the, on the Japanese and the German, and in four years, we could win that kind of battle. Here we've been in 10 years in Afghanistan, and it's draining us. There's... Uh, uh, an estimate now over $4 trillion has been added to our national debt in the last 10 years for fighting wars that, quite frankly, in my viewpoint, shouldn't have been started, and we ought to come home from all those regions right now. But the country right now is facing an economic crisis. It's a consequence of the overspending overseas, but the overspending here at home, too. Uh, we have gone a long way from the self-reliance and independence that made America great. We had the greatest document to protect our liberties, our Constitution. We had the freest system ever, and we had the most prosperous system. And along with that, what we get is a big middle class. But today, if you want to measure the loss of liberty and the loss of confidence in our constitutional government, just look at the size of the middle class and the problems the middle class is facing today. The middle class is shrinking. It is poorer, but the wealthy get wealthier. So there's a lot to be said about the complaints of the gravitation of wealth in the hands of the few. People who get wealthy because they provide a service for people. There's no problem with that. If they give you a good service or a good product and we make a person wealthy, we shouldn't be envious and say, well, what we have to do is tax them more. But if somebody gets wealthy because they have an inside track to a government contract or they know how the monetary system works, they get the benefits or they get the bailouts when trouble comes along, that is a different story. And right now we have seen the transfer of wealth from the middle class to the wealthy. And even if you did nothing else other than just debase the currency, devalue the currency systematically, it will transfer wealth from the middle class uh, to, to the wealthy. Since our Federal Reserve was established in 1930, in 1913, we have had a dollar, uh, a dollar value go down to about four cents. It's systematic, it's steady. And the people who benefit the most when you allow a government to print money out of thin air are the people who get to use it first. And who are those people? The government? The corporations, the banks, the military industrial complex, the people who are, are on the inside track, they spend the money and it has value. When it circulates among the people, all of a sudden it's discovered that the money is, has losing, it's losing its value and the cost goes up. So when you see cost goes up, you can't blame labor, you can't blame business, but you have to blame the devaluation of the currency. So the more the government gets involved, the more you will see the prices going up, whether it's in housing. We got a housing bubble price go up. NASDAQ, government involved in the financial market. NASDAQ bubble goes up. Medical care, the government's been involved for 40 years. I practiced medicine before the government was involved, and the office calls were 3 or $5. And now look at what's happening, because the government channels money into it with the pretense and the good intention of making sure everybody has free health care. But generally what it does, it pushes costs up, and what happens is somebody takes over the, uh, the dollars. Now we have corporate medicine rather than doctor-patient relationship. We have the drug companies who are influential in lobbying as well as the insurance companies and the hospital and medical management companies, so they continue to go up. Education is the same way. 
government was very much involved in education. They wanted everybody to get a college education. I'd love that. I think that's very important, at least the maximum number of people. But what it generally did was push the costs up. So we had more people graduating, but less people qualified for the jobs that we need. We still have people that jobs are going begging because our people aren't properly trained. But we have a lot of people graduating from college right now, and guess what they have? They have a diploma, but they also have a bill. And they also owe a lot of money, and they owe more money than all our credit cards. That's how serious that problem is. And the worst part is, I mean, it was sort of that they were brought into this and figuring it was the best thing to do, and they wanted the education. But what they didn't realize is that the economy, as it sinks, it'll be more difficult to get jobs. So they end up with a diploma. They end up with almost like being indentured servants to the banks and no jobs. And uh, we have, as a country, have done so much to undermine our economy that in the last 10 years, we've had about a 30 million people increase in population since the year 2000. But really, no new, uh, new, no new productive jobs. Jobs have gone overseas because our biggest export, exports today is our dollar. We issue the reserve currency of the world, which is like issuing gold. Because people take it as if it's the best currency. So that encourages us to spend our money overseas. And guess what? Our jobs go overseas. But what do we get? You think, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. But the trouble is it goes into debt. And that's why we now owe foreigners $3 trillion. And most of it is for to uh, we owe it to Japan and China. So they have a lot holding, uh, you know, they can hold over us now. But we also owe this $15 trillion. So debt is the problem. And we have been taught in our colleges and by our economists for many, many decades, ever since the Depression, that there's nothing wrong with debt. Debt is good. If, you, if the economy is slowing, it's because the people don't spend enough money. So they come back and they want you to spend money. Even if you're too much in debt, and even if you're worried about the future and you want to save, they want you to spend money thinking that spending money, not savings and investing is important, but just spending money. But they have this theory that if the people don't spend enough money, You know what they say should be done? The government should spend the money. So they want to raise taxes. They want to borrow money. They want to print money. Just spending money will solve the problem until they get too much debt. And that's where we are today. We're facing a debt crisis. It's a worldwide debt crisis. The dollar is involved in every country and every bank. Europe is is, uh, in big trouble. We are currently now with our Federal Reserve and Treasury doing business over in Europe, promising to bail out the euro. The euro is in trouble because their banks bought debt from co- countries like Greece and uh, Italy and Spain. So they're literally in a, 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 on the verge of the bankruptcy because the debt isn't worth anything. But if, the, if, the, if they default, then the banks are in trouble. So we're over there promising we will bail them out. Uh, not so much bailing out the people of Greece, but the banks that bought the debt and they shouldn't have bought the debt. Under those circumstances, if you want a market economy and you want to correct it, the people who make bad mistakes and buy bad debt and get into trouble, they should be allowed to go bankrupt. But in 2008, when our crisis hit, uh, they rushed to Washington. The big banks and the corporations said, we're in big trouble. If you don't bail us out, it will be the end of the world, and, uh, and you have to come up with the money. So Congress came up with over a trillion dollars. The Fed got involved and spent like $15 trillion, seven of it overseas, bailing out banks. And all that did was transfer the debt. The correction of getting rid of the debt and the bad investments, the mistakes made, you have to get that out of the way so you can have growth again. So instead of eliminating that debt, we ended up owning it. We, the taxpayer, end up owning this debt, and it's still on the books. It's on our books, and that's why it's very difficult to get growth again. You can understand this. If you're an individual and you got over your head in spending, you know, too much debt, and you finally get to the point where all your income is going to paying the interest on your debt, how can you get ahead? So you either have to change your living style or you have to go into default and have bankruptcy. You have to work harder, but you have to get rid of the debt to have growth again. But 
politically, it's very difficult to get a country to do that. Before our depression, it was accepted. Things would get out of whack, principally caused by our Federal Reserve. They did that in the Depression. But by the time we got to the Depression time, the economic theories changed, and they said, don't let any defaults. The government has to bail out everybody. And that's why our Depression lasted about 17 years, all through the 30s, through World War II, and then after the war was over, that Depression uh, finally ended. So this is the reason that we have to deal with debt. And it's challenging because how do you stop spending? How many people are dependent on the government? You know, more than half the people in this country get a check from the government. And how do we do this? Are we going to change policy uh, or, or what will happen? I say you have to change policy. You have to change what the role of government is. You can't just say we're going to prop it up, transfer debt, borrow more money, print more money, regulate more, and, and, uh, and not change anything. So my goal is to find the easiest places to cut because if we don't cut something, everybody suffers together because there will be a destruction of the currency and we can send checks out, but it won't buy anything. Already people on their Social Security, their standard of living is going down because you can't keep up with the inflation rate. The government says there's only an inflation rate of 2%. The truth is – if you're retired and living on fixed income, it's closer to 10 percent. So the economy is uh, being very difficult uh, for you. But what I want to do is, um, is, is pick priorities, where to cut and where not to cut. Where I would not cut, to, you know, to start off with, I would not cut the promises made to those who are going to receive Social Security benefits. I would not cut health benefits, and I would not cut uh, benefits to the elderly or the or the kids who are getting health benefits. That's not to say that was the best system. But if we're going to have a transition, work out our way and, let them and try to prevent a collapse of the economy, which is possibly could happen, uh, at least we could preserve that. But we still have to cut, and that is the reason that I have have a bold plan to cut. I'm the only one that has real cuts. There's no real cuts proposed in Washington nor by the other candidates. So what I would do is cut $1 trillion out of the budget the first year. Now, the big question is, where, where is it going to be cut and who's going to be hurt? Well, the people who depend on government bailouts, they're going to get hurt. But... <laughs> And uh, I would also say that we have enough weapons to defend ourselves. We are the strongest country in the world. We have more weapons than anybody else in the world. We're not, on, uh, we're not being threatened by uh, an in invasion. So I would say that we don't need to buy more weapons. We don't need more weapons that we don't uh, uh, n need for our national defense. And uh, we don't need to be arming the rest of the world this very day. We're sending more weapons to the Middle East because the longer we're there and the more difficulty there is, these countries are rebelling against dictators that we have propped up and we're now not only in about six countries, we're on the verge. Uh, there's talk now that the president is already secretly being involved in the war in Syria, the, the uh, civil war there and there's many who have proposed for many years to uh, get involved militarily with, with Iran. So if, if we continue to do that, uh, we're serving some powerful special interests. So I would say Number one on the list in order to get back onto a balance is to change our foreign policy. And we can do that by cutting a lot of spending out of military and not cut one penny out of defense. You cannot equate military spending, just spending more money on weapons and involvement around the world and starting another war. That diminishes our national defense. So what I would like to do is change the foreign policy, cut massively the spending, and just say, look, we're too many places. The Soviets were brought down because that is exactly what they did. We didn't have to fight them. They finally went bankrupt, and we're on the verge of that. So what I would do is say, look, we've had troops way too long in too many countries. We don't need to be adding countries. We're currently adding countries. Like I said, we're talking about going into Syria, into Iran. We're in Afghanistan, in, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Somalia, into Uganda now. And we just the other day, we put troops in, in Australia. I mean, what do we need troops in Australia for? So I would say instead of adding to that, let's start subtracting from that. I'm for bringing troops home. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> How 
how long should we how long should we be in Japan? That war's over, you know. It's been over, and we've been trading with Japan for a while, and they're our banker now. So it's time we quit subsidizing their defense. Just come home from Japan and South Korea. Come home from Germany. Why do we subsidize their economy by paying for their defense and having troops there? I'd come home there, and I'd stop these wars. Ten years is long enough in Afghanistan. I'd say just come home and bring the troops home. The one immediate effect by bringing troops home before you even change the budget or anything, the president has the authority to move the troops around, is all that military spending. Guess what? It would be spent here in this economy rather than the German economy and the South Korean economy and the Japanese economy. So there could be some immediate benefits. But it would also send an immediate signal that the policy is going to change and this is not going to bankrupt us. We don't need this policy that continues to be a great burden to us, like I said, $4 trillion trillion of extra debt in the last 10 years for the wars that we have been fighting over there. That still wouldn't be enough. You could get hundreds of billions saved from that way, but you have to cut some other things. And I think there are some departments that we have. We have way too many departments. If you have, if you're a strict constitutionalist, there are few, very few departments uh, of government that we need. So I would cut five of the departments, but I would start with the one that seems to be like the, maybe the easiest and doesn't enhance uh, uh, our educational system. I'd get rid of the Department of Education. But even cutting five departments and uh, dealing with our foreign policy, we would still have to do some adjusting to the budget. We need to go back to the levels of government that we were spending back in the year 2006. And uh, nobody was complaining about the government being too small in, in, in 2006. But this is quite different than anything anything anybody else is proposing, whether it's in Washington or the other candidates, they're only talking about cutting proposed increases. They do what they call baseline budgeting, automatically increases all the way out. Everybody gets more money the next year, not only because they want bigger government, but they also want uh, to deal with the inflation. But if you deal with the monetary policy, you stop the inflation. And then if we have a constitutional approach to government, all of a sudden, these expenditures shouldn't be necessary. What we have today is based on the assumption that the people don't know what to do with their lives and what to do with their money. One day I had a vote on the House floor. I can't remember exactly what the vote did, but it had to do with a regulation on individual individuals to help protect them from themselves. You know, it was one of these personal things. I say, I said, well, why why are you doing this to make sure this individual will, uh, you know, uh, do what you want them to do? I said, uh, why don't you just let them make up their own mind? He said, they're not. He says they're too dumb. This is a congressman saying the people are too dumb to figure out what they should do and they won't be responsible. But, you know, a lot of people, <clears throat> you know, fed into that and believed it. But one of the reasons why we're getting so much more attention and people are so much more interested is they know that the government can't fulfill their promises. The government, we, we're the government and the money is in there and you can't keep borrowing and printing. And so there's a big event that has occurred here in the last four years. Uh, although it was gradual, I said over the last 25, 30 years, it's been gradual growth in the interest in the constitutional government. But there's been a dramatic interest in, uh, you know, here in the last four years because of the economic crisis, because people are now tired of the war and they want something different. Now, I'm convinced we got into this mess by not following the Constitution. So it seems like the solution shouldn't be all that difficult. You know, why don't we just send people there that we believe will obey the Constitution? Seems like that should, you know, be able to solve many of our problems. But we have to deal with monetary policy. One of the reasons why I talk about the Federal Reserve a lot is because they create money out of thin air. Which, if you're on a gold standard, you can't print money under thin air. You have to pay for government. You just can't delay the payment by just counterfeiting the money. Now, why did the founders put this into the Constitution? They did not give authority for central banking, which is the Federal Reserve. And they also said that only gold and silver can be legal tender and that you couldn't print paper money. So they did that because they had runaway inflation at the beginning of our history with the continental dollar. And they didn't want that to happen. They knew it destroyed wealth and, and it was very difficult. So uh, when, when they wanted government to grow faster, which was in the 19s, in the teens, the 1913 is when it was passed, they passed the income tax and 
the Federal Reserve. And if you look at the statistics from 1913 on, growth of government and the involvement in overseas activities just exponentially grew. There was always some restraints on the monetary system up until 1971. Since then, it has escalated even more. So the more uh, the more money we spend, the bigger the government is, the bigger the government is, the more control they have over your life, the more control they have over your personal liberties, and the more they can have control over your over your money. And uh, so we now have a country that doesn't honor and respect personal liberty like we should and personal responsibility. We don't respect property rights like we should. One example of, of property rights, of course, uh, if you want to use your property a certain way, you have to get a lot of a lot of permits. So, you know, if you're in development business or building a house, it's from le- low level all the way up to the top, and you have to get permission from the uh, federal government uh, for many things. I'm fearful because some people would like us to go all the way to the UN and have the UN controlling our land too. So control of land is not in your hands as an owner of land. If I f- I feel like we are renters and we pay for we pay rent to stay on our land if anything goes wrong we get blamed for it but also if that land goes up in value you know with uh, say um, inflation rates or value for other reasons all of a sudden it, it gets involved in that category where where you want to pass it on to the next generation the government says well we're part owners so we want one third of this or one half of it so they have this inheritance tax under my idea of good economic policy of preserving capital and also constitutional government where you don't need this money, I think the, uh, I think the uh, inheritance tax should be 0%. That's what I think it should be. Because cap- capital is important. You have to build capital. If, it, if uh, when you pass on a business and you have to break it up, that's destructive to capital. And the monetary system uh, encourages capital to leave our country. Tax policies encourages our capital to leave our country. And therefore, these things have to be changed if we want to change the environment to invite capital back to our, our country and, and have jobs uh, once again. But right now, the, the conditions aren't very conducive for that. So we have to have a change attitude. We had this attitude, the proper attitude, for a long time. I, I think we have lost that, and we have been too dependent on the transfer of wealth from government from one group to another. But uh, the transferring of wealth works for a while when the country is very wealthy. Now, on the surface, we appear to be pretty wealthy, but it's sort of like the apparent wealth before the housing bubble burst. You know, people were doing well. They had good income. They had two houses and things in their house values were going up and they could borrow against their house equity and they thought it would last forever. But it was debt. It was debt. And then when the prices changed, this thing just came down and the housing bubble, uh, housing bubble collapsed. So our wealth in the last 30, 40 years has been based on debt. Uh, and uh, th- therefore, we have to deal with this to get us back to being a more productive nation, which requires these various things on changing, uh, changing in policy. But ultimately, it isn't just just foreign policy or just domestic policy. What we have to deal with is, as a people, we have to see what the role of government should be. And if the role of government is to uh, be the policeman of the world, if the role of government is to take care of everybody from cradle to grave, and that everybody gets free this and free education and free medical care, uh, you really can't change anything. It'll just be fussing and fuming until this whole thing falls apart. Uh, But if the role of government should be what the founders wanted to be, it was to protect liberty. Now, how did they want our liberties to protect, uh, uh, be protected? They did add the Bill of Rights, and that's very, very important. But basically, the Constitution, in order to protect our liberties, was to restrain the federal government. So there are a lot of thou shalt nots by the federal government, and the only thing they were allowed to do was, were the ones they listed, especially in Article 1, Section 8. This is what the government's allowed to do. The rest, it's retained for the rights and the powers are retained to the people and to the states. So the, the, this, the government was meant to be local and, uh, and not national. 
Uh, but we have drifted away from that for so long that now we have ended up with this, this huge deficit. But we once again, as the founders had made this decision on what the role of government ought to be, they didn't like the role of the king. The king was starting wars and taxing them, invading their houses, stationing military in their, in their homes. And so they had a revolution and they wanted to change all that. But we need an intellectual revolution. And I think it is going on right now to decide once again what the role of government ought to be and whether or not we should have that government to be taking care of us. Uh, and I think the whole issue of personal liberty is the big issue. I, for personal reason, would vouch for and argue the case for personal liberty even if my standard of living went down because I, I, I uh, you, you know, believe that liberty is so precious. But the fantastic thing about it is if you opt for freedom first, the prosperity comes automatically. You don't have to give up prosperity for our freedoms. But we, we must also have personal goals in our life, and it's a free society that provides for them. And my personal goal in life is, in my personal way, to strive for excellence and virtue. And that is a personal matter. It's a family matter. It's a church matter. It's the emphasis on the preciousness of life, new life and unborn life, how valuable life is. But if government gets involved in the business of trying to uh, uh, make you virtuous and, uh, and, and make you a better person, Person, believe me, they can only do this at the expense of liberty. And they're trying to do this all the time. Some want to tell you how to behave in a better manner, that you don't know how to take care of yourselves or discipline your children or educate your children. And others think you have to have the, your dollars controlled because you might waste your money. You might not spend it right. And those people in Washington know exactly what you should do. So it's this lack of confidence that we should make those decisions. Does that mean that people will make all the right decisions? No. There are some that's going to make make mistakes. But if you want the maximum amount of prosperity and the maximum the best distribution, you have to go with that system because once the government gets involved, they will do what they have done to us. They will bankrupt the country. They will undermine our personal liberties. They will get us more engaged overseas than we should be. And we will forget about the fundamentals. Today, though, I'm very encouraged because there have been a lot of changes made. There's been a lot of changes in the, in the sentiments. I see it not only in the campaign but around the country in the last several years. And especially, I have been going to the college campuses for years and years. The crowds were small and interested but not excited. Today, the college campuses know exactly, the young people know exactly what they're getting. And they do understand they're very open to these ideas. They're open to studying about the Federal Reserve and our history and why freedom can provide the prosperity that we want. And we have to have that confidence that, 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 that it will work. Freedom has been tested just rather rarely in all of, all of history. Uh, for most of history, probably 90, 95% of the time, uh, people have had to live under dictatorship. And as our government gets bigger and violates our civil liberties with certain laws like the Patriot Act and invasion of our privacy, they become more dictatorial. So we are losing those liberties, but uh, our, uh, our system has, has, was the greatest test, and what I fear is that we're going to give this up. And as it's given up, if we don't deal with these problems... What I am afraid that there will be more violence. There will be people who will get angry because they're not going to get what they believe they have a right to. So if you've been providing for something that other people are getting and they get angry, we already see this in Europe. We already see some of it on our own streets. People get angry and upset. And uh, if they don't understand these issues, then I think that – and if we don't understand that to change the policy, it's going to get a lot worse and then there will be chaos and people will be even more willing to give up their liberties. But I am also convinced, and I said this even right after 9-11, that if you want to be safe, you do not have to give up your liberties. Not at all. Matter, matter of fact, it's your liberties that can help protect you, and I think that's why the founders gave us the Second Amendment. Yeah. <laughs> 
But though we face a lot of problems, and it sounds like I'm a bit pessimistic about what's going on in Washington and what we can do and should do, I'm really pretty optimistic about the way things are changing. I'm optimistic about the philosophy of liberty because I see that it brings people together. And the way to understand this is, isn't it pretty good? I mean, there's some bigotry in the world and the country, but don't you see that we bring people together for religious values? We all have. We go to different churches, and uh, we should be tolerant of people who don't go to church, but that's what freedom does. Freedom gives you an opportunity to run your life as you see fit if you don't hurt anybody else. If that is the case, people who like freedom for different reasons should all be on the same page. And I... That means some people say, well, no, you've got to be judgmental. They might not use their freedom in a proper way. Well, that is true. You have, to be, uh, you have to be rather tolerant if they're not hurting people, if they do things that you don't like. But if you're tolerant of something, it doesn't mean you endorse it. In religion, people do things that you say, I couldn't believe that. But you, you don't endorse it, but you can legalize those choices in religion and personal values. So this is why I'm optimistic, and this is what I think young people especially seem to be able to bring this together. And this is the reason why I have been able to work with people who call themselves progressives, even some that call themselves Democrats, you know, and independents, you know, and they say, you know, this makes sense. This would bring people together uh, rather than be divisive and get over in this one quarter and over quarter over here. But freedom really does bring people together, and that's what brought us together. That's why we had the, uh, the largest middle class and the freest and the most prosperous middle class in the country ever. We don't have it today, but we have our answers. We don't have to invent it. It's buried in our tradition. So what I am working for and asking you for help for is to restore the greatness of this country and emphasis placed on individual liberty, emphasizing and understanding and knowing exactly where our life and our liberties come from, and that is that they, they, they come from our Creator, and therefore all life is precious, and if we want to protect liberty, we also have to always protect all life. Under those circumstances, we can be a great and prosperous and a peaceful nation once again. That sounds like a great message, doesn't it? Is that the kind of message you'd like Iowans to get behind on January 3rd? And is that the kind of message you'd like to send to America? Limited government, cutting a trillion dollars, protecting life? Well, we're down to less than 100 hours until the Iowa caucus, and you have an opportunity within your precinct to send a message to Washington that we're sick and tired of what we're getting, and we're not going to take it anymore. We're not going to take establishment politicians they continue to tell us a line and go to Washington and don't follow through. So show up on January 3rd, work, it, work in your precinct, talk to your neighbors, and uh, discuss with them about what Congressman Paul talked about today. We do have some time for a few quick questions uh, from Iowans uh, prior to our next event. Uh, so if you'd raise your hand, I will come out to you with a microphone. Is this a, okay, we're working. I want to say I want to thank you for saying we should bring our troops home. I come from a military uh, family where I've had uh, children, uh, son-in-laws, uh, grandson and that. And I also realize that, as you have said, we set up some guns and ammunition and that in other countries to train their uh, police and military. And some of those actually turn around and kill our soldiers. You're right. You're right. Song for you. Thank you very much. Be, let me just make a brief comment. She brings up the subject about, uh, you know, the military. I served for five years in the military. And uh, also what I'm very proud of, because sometimes people like to turn it around. You may have been on the receiving end. If you don't say blindly support the troops and blindly support every war. If you don't, you're un-American. You don't support the troops. I've heard that. But the truth is, is that troops give me a lot of support. 
uh, we get uh, in our campaign twice as much money as all the other candidates put together from active military duty. So I think that's a strong message, too. First off, thank you for answering questions directly and quickly. You answer the question, so thank you. Uh, is, a lot of your critics are, are nervous about you and what's going on in Iran. They're accusing that if you, know, you get in leadership, Iran's going to make a move and we won't have anything to answer it. Is, is there ever, uh, is, is ever going to be a time when pre, a preemptive strike is necessary to prevent like a, another Hitler? Do you ever see preemption as a part of our Paul policy? No, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, he, he knows and understands uh, that I'm a non-interventionist. I don't want to get involved in the internal affairs. But is there ever a time that you should use preemption? And pre, a preemptive war means actually you start the war. And uh, I, can't, I can't really conceive of it. Uh, but there is something maybe close to this. The president, this was well discussed at the Constitutional Convention. And that is, the president is the commander in chief. He does not go to war without permission from the, from the Congress. But even in the old days when travel was more difficult, if Congress wasn't in session, uh, especially, the president had a right to retaliate and, you know, an attack. If he's, and that's easy. I think we can agree on that. If, if also there's an attack and also an imminent attack, you know, that you don't have to wait until they put their feet on our soil, but if they're battleships off to our shore. So an imminent attack, the president has an obligation, uh, to, to respond there. But to, to say that, uh, and you brought up the subject of Iran, uh, to say that, uh, yes, uh, you know, we need to go in and theoretically, let's say you're making the case that, well, they might get a nuclear weapon someday, and wouldn't it be good if we had a preemptive attack on Iran right now to make sure they never got a weapon? I would say no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, uh, mainly because... Um, uh, the, the, right now, there's no no signs that they are. There's a lot of propaganda that they are, but it is no different than the propaganda before Iraq. They said they had weapons of mass destruction. And they did not. They said Al Qaeda was there. They, there was no Al Qaeda there. There was no threat to our national security. The only exception would be if you could take it to the Congress and say that um, there is that there is a threat to our national security. And therefore, Congress gives proper authority with a declaration. But just for the president to arbitrarily say, okay, like, like uh, just going into Libya, that was done under the U.N. and NATO without consultation with the Congress. It's out of control. And we, and we don't uh, go to war in a proper manner any, anymore. But with, as far as Iran is concerned right now, they don't have a weapon. They're not likely to get one. Um, they could. They probably desire to have one. Uh, it's been recognized. But if they had one weapon, what, what are the odds of them using it? Probably zero. I mean, they're just not going to commit suicide. I mean, the, the, uh, the Israelis have 300 of them, you know, and they're, they're, not, going to, and they're not going to do that. So uh, I, I think that uh, even if they got a weapon, would I be ready to go to war against them? No, I, I don't want to go to war with them. I, I don't feel like they're going to threaten our national security. Uh, if some other country thought they had to go to war with them, uh, that, that is their business. But, you know, when I was in the service between 62 and 68, and no, 63 and 68, that was the height of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, 30,000 nuclear <laughs> missiles and bombs, and we were... They were on our border and we were on their border. And uh, we had a policy then at least, the, and, and the leaders of both China and Russia at the Soviet Union were vicious. They killed hundreds of millions of people, but we still talked to them. And Kennedy talked to Khrushchev, you know, and said, well, if you take my, if missiles out of Turkey, we'll take them out of Cuba. And they made a deal. We didn't have an exchange of weapons. And, and I think... I think we shouldn't give up on that that so easily. We should be uh, be willing to do that. But overall, the uh, in in the during the Cold War, with us facing off with the Soviets, uh, it was mostly a policy of containment. If you can contain the the, Rus uh, the Russians, the Soviets, and China, 
I mean, don't you think we could contain a country that doesn't even have enough gasoline? They have all this oil and they don't even have enough refinery capacity to give gasoline to their cars. We don't want to overreact right now. I fear overreaction as much, much more so than underreaction, let me tell you. <laughs> My name is Sam Wessels. I am nine, almost ten years old. I have autism. Autism is reaching epidemic proportions. America now has some of the world's sickest children. If you are elected president, what will you do to protect America's most valuable resource, her children? Well, the most valuable resource for children, teenagers, college kids, and adults is our liberties. And that is the most important thing that we can do. If you protect those liberties, you will have the maximum amount of prosperity. You will have the maximum amount of, uh, you will have the maximum amount of uh, progress in a country to take care of all kinds of medical diseases. If you turn those responsibilities over to the government, you are going to have less efficiency. Now, in my program, when I'm talking about cutting back, I mentioned that I would certainly protect programs that would be helpful if they're already in motion, and I wouldn't start with those. So protecting the health care of children or, or the elderly, I, I see that in a transition program. But I, like I said earlier, that if we're careless, we're going to have more trouble taking care of the children, taking care of our people. We've messed up on housing. We've messed up on education. And uh, we're in the process of messing up on, on health care. But uh, we should not give up on the idea that a free society would not be generous and very productive and uh, very caring. Uh, we are a very caring nation with our own people and people overseas when they're in distress, and yet we're getting to be a poorer nation. So the most important thing is to preserve our liberties, preserve our prosperity, and I believe our problems can be solved rather adequately. Uh, Dr. Paul, it's an honor to meet you and see you. Um, I'm an United Army veteran. And, uh, what steps would you take to get rid of the Federal Reserve, which is the number one enemy to our country today? <laughs> I always get an easy question, at least. <laughs> but the getting started is an easy answer, but, you know, accomplishing it all would not be easy. No, I've talked about the Fed, and I mentioned in my talk that that was one of the motivating factors I got, uh, got involved in because it has so much to do with our business cycle. And um, the most important thing we could do is have openness. And uh, I have proposed bills in the Congress to audit the Federal Reserve, and, and we've gotten pretty far with those, even though they weren't passed. We had token audits. Finding out what they're doing would be the most important thing. Find out which businesses they're propping out, which banks they're propping up, openness in government. The one thing in a free society is uh, the, go the Constitution the government is supposed to protect your privacy. The government is supposed to be open. Today, your privacy is not protected, and there's ultimate secrecy of government. So we don't want secrecy in the Federal Reserve. I believe that we would have the momentum, if I'm to be elected, the momentum will continue, and we will get a lot more. Then there would have to be some reforms. The ultimate reform is to get rid of it. But my to get rid of it is uh, expose, it, expose them for what they are and legalize your right to use constitutional money. Today, if you opt and decide, uh, I'm going to use gold and silver coinage, uh, you'll be in big trouble. And uh, so they have it turned on its head. Uh, but I would like to legalize the competition and work for openness. Then I think the people then would understand the reason why we have to do something with the Federal Reserve. What would we base the money supply on? Well, the Constitution said only gold and silver can be. And people like to paint what I say is going back to the old days and, and doing it exactly before. No, we, we need to obey the Constitution, but we can modernize things. I think the market should make a decision, and we may be sophisticated enough to have maybe a basket of currencies, uh, competing currencies. It, you just can't defraud people. It, and before, it used to be gold and silver, and they were fixed ratio.
it's better that you have one or the others so you can really improve on it. It was not a perfect standard, but it was so much better than what we have today when we allow a, a few individuals in a dark room decide how much money is going to be printed next week and what the interest rates are going to be. So, But I'd like the market to help us decide exactly what kind of a, a backing of the currency we should have. Okay, it looks like I have to move along, and I thank you very much for coming in. I enjoyed the visit. Thank you.